All right, I'll start before my network uh, has issues again. Uh, so welcome everyone to the April uh, webinar uh, and presentation for ITE. Um, just wanted to give you a, a bit of our updates. So our next monthly luncheon is going to be a Deerfoot Trail study. Um, and we've also been planning some of our future events for later in the year uh, with a ring road presentation. We've got the U of C students uh, coming back again as well as planning for a joint session later in the year with um, CSCE. Um, and just a couple of comments about some of the conferences that are coming up. You may have heard some of the chat that we we're having uh, there. The um, CITE conference is going to be virtual this year in June. Uh, and also the uh, IT bypass project during construction and closeout phases and is currently um, the manager for Southwest Calgary Ring Road project. Uh, and Jason um, as the traffic engineer lead for the Regina Bypass Project um, for and he's been involved in the pursuit and design of construction phases and is the design manager for the Kicking Horse Canyon Project right now. Um, okay and I will turn it over to Jim. I've already got it Dan, we, we thought oh. we lost you there. Oh, you've so. me for a while, so excellent. Okay, perfect, you're on it. Yeah. Thanks very much. Sorry uh, if I missed your introductions. I don't know what part I got dropped off on, so if you need to reintroduce yourself, please do that. Yeah, um, thanks, Anne. Appreciate that. Oh, sorry, I just had a pop-up here. Technical issues abound. Can everybody see the presentation? Yep, you're good. Thank you. Thanks, Ann. Um, it cut out, so my name is James Sulphur. Um, some of you know me as Jim. Um, I was the design manager for the um, construction, the last half of the construction and the closeout phases of Regina Bypass. Uh, it's the exciting job where we get to clean up everything and make sure we're all meeting our obligations to the contract and satisfying our engineering obligations um, to our partners. Sorry, everybody, Teams keeps popping into this. Uh, go ahead, introduce yourself, Jason, please, and I'll try to get rid of this. Yeah, hi, everyone. I was a traffic engineer lead uh, during the project, uh, both for uh, temporary traffic staging and uh, some of the permanent uh, traffic elements that we incorporated in the bypass. Uh, so kind of lived the dream in uh, in Regina uh, for the first three years of construction. Okay, so we've got a, an agenda. We do um, at Parsons. We have six core values uh, contained in them. Of course, is safety and and quality among others. Um, so we usually start our presentations or our meetings with a core value moment. We'll do that here. So we'll walk through the agenda. Um, it's a quick slide deck. Uh, most of the information is going to come through talking. We've tried to keep the uh, motion sickness to a, a minimum for you today. So the core value moment today uh, is about humility. And um, a colleague once said, to have a good mind for quality, you have to have a mind of humility. So that means essentially we need to acknowledge mistakes if we want to um, be able to analyze them and prevent them from reoccurring. So when we make a mistake, we need to stop, think about why we, it has happened or what we could have done about it, address the cause, or we risk um, repeating it. So who do you trust more? The person who tells you, A, everything's fine, we don't have any problems, or person B, uh, yes, we have had some problems in this area but here's what we did or some ideas to fix it so the regina bypass project timeline planning for the project started in the 1990s um, drivers of the project we'll get to in a moment the procurement for this uh, started in 2013 um, contract was executed on july of 2015 Phase one was completed, so phase one's the dark blue on the east, um, was completed October 2017, and the balance of the project in phase two was open um, in October 2019. 2019 was the trigger for the 30-year operation and maintenance period, and in 2049, there would be a turnover to the uh, 
Ministry of Highways and Infrastructure of Saskatchewan. So project scope and the area context, um, of course, MHI, Saskatchewan Ministry of Highways and Infrastructure, delivered this as the owner through Sask Builds, which is their alternative delivery and funding arm. Um, the infrastructure composes 240 highway lane kilometers, 12 interchanges, 55 kilometers of new service roads, and the twinning of Highway 6. Uh, vehicle serviced between 11, 1,500 to 25,000 vehicles per day. Uh, I don't know what the COVID numbers look like, but uh, perhaps Jason has some information on that with um, some of the numbers he got from MHI. And some of the characteristics of the traffic, of course, commuter. Um, the Regina Bypass replaced Victoria Avenue, which went through downtown Regina prior to uh, this road opening. So it's been a, a real boon to uh, locals um, commuting. Agricultural equipment, obviously some unique challenges there. Um, some of the largest equipment I've ever seen uh, turning some of the cul-de-sacs. And of course, we couldn't accommodate them all, but uh, we did our best. Farm accesses, um, so again, unique access off of a highway situation uh, for farming and agricultural purposes. And then large permitted tractor-trailer combinations. So the project team, of course, uh, this is led uh, by the Ministry of Highways and Infra Infrastructure. Uh, the funding for the project is approaching $1.9 billion uh, through the life of the operation and maintenance phases. Um, the concessionaire being Regina Bypass Partners is the actual contract holder with MHI and SASC Builds. They hired Regina Bypass Design Builders and that's where um, we executed the design and build portion of the project and turned it over to the operations and maintenance team, uh, Regina Bypass Operations and Maintenance. Inside of that, uh, we didn't do this alone, of course. Um, so in the design build joint venture was our lead partner, Graham Construction, um, Parsons, and then Vinci Concessions, and um, as well as CarMax. So the four partners came together and um, delivered the project. Inside of that, they hired Parsons as the uh, contracted Parsons for the lead design role. And we, of course, added some sub consultants in there, notably uh, McElhaney and Urban Systems Limited, had large portions of the work uh, and assisted us. Um, I want to say that we had Canadian Highways Institute for road safety audit, but we didn't. Uh, he belonged to the owner, uh, but he was a, a big part of the team too uh, in Dr. John Morrell. So just to to pick up on some issues that uh, that were underway prior to implementation, and um, you know, like like most major projects, uh, you know, there was a almost a 12 month uh, build up to the actual uh, execution of the work. You know, there was a pursuit and proposal phase, um, and and in the interim, um, you know, as we were doing our our research and work and planning and design. Um, you know, the, the issues on the corridor, uh, this, this phase one corridor were quite apparent. Um, what we have here are just a selection of, of uh, CBC news items uh, that occurred between July when the contract was executed um, and into the fall uh, when we were actually uh, mobilizing, starting our construction. So um, obviously growth on the Highway 1 corridor was, was, was quite significant. There was a lot of outlying communities uh, growing and, and needing access uh, to, to Regina. Uh, the Highway 1 TransCanada was their, their only real front door access to and from their communities. Um, there's congestion on Victoria Avenue uh, due to the tractor trailer traffic uh, moving, moving through uh, traffic signals. And the collision patterns uh, that we're seeing here is really uh, typical of at grade intersections on, on high speed highways a lot of right angle, high severity collisions. Um, and that was coupled with constraints. Um, it, it, was, it was difficult. I think a lot of, lot of us have, have been in a situation where, um, you know, we can diagnose a problem, whether it's safety or congestion, but um, it, it's, it's not within our control to act. Either we don't have the funding, we don't have property, we haven't done the, the full design yet. 
Um, so there was a lot of this in the lead up uh, to the to the award of our contract, and and in a sense, we were able to uh, uh, to act on these uh, with a real sense of urgency. So with all this in mind, um, you know, here are some of the items that we we had to consider as we were developing our traffic management plan for the corridor. Um, obviously, the sense of urgency. Uh, there was some synergy there in that. You know, we we had a mission. We had to to get this work complete um, in a very short time frame. Uh, the community wanted action, um, and 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 you know, we had to ensure their safety while we were completing our work. Um, temporary traffic controls. We were going to be working in very close proximity to some of these high collision intersections. Uh, so you know, doing piling work, creating embankments, all of these things were going to potentially add uh, to the safety concerns that folks had. Um, so we had to really come up with a, an access plan that would work for everyone. We also had, uh, you know, given the, uh, the operation and maintenance, the 30 year period, um, we wanted to complete rehabilitation work on the existing highway, the existing four lane highway, um, prior to turning it over to, to operations and maintenance. Um, we didn't want to get to a point where we had completed these brand new interchanges and then had to shut down the highway again uh, for extensive uh, full depth rehabilitation. Uh, so we wanted to come up with a plan that would integrate this work into our into our interchange staging. So um, what you hear, see here are a couple of solutions. Um, we did an extensive uh, staged crossover plan along the highway, uh, shifting traffic uh to to bi-directional on each carriageway uh, while we while we rehabbed and completed um other earthworks and uh, we made use of portable traffic control signals at some of these problematic intersections uh, so uh, really helping to work in some of these constrained areas and allowing people access uh, during this uh this construction phase so this kind of illustrates an approach at, uh, this was the Pilot Butte intersection. Um, you can see the bottom left uh, snapshot there, that's from Google Earth, uh, just prior to us stopping, so, or starting work. The, uh, the intersection, pretty typical of, of many uh, rural locations, uh, but understanding that given its proximity to Regina, was really experiencing a lot of traffic that you know, it, it was uh, just not scaling up for. Um, what we did here is uh, in order to accelerate the delivery of what you see on the far right, which is a brand new grade separated diverging diamond interchange, um, we had to isolate the work area completely. Um, we, uh, we implemented a detour uh, to an adjacent uh, service road access. Uh, put some temporary traffic signals in uh, to accommodate traffic um, over the course of the two-year period and went to work uh, in almost complete isolation and were able to accelerate uh, the opening of that uh, interchange uh, by over a year. So there was obviously, um, you know, a trade-off there. Uh, we recognized there would be some additional delays due to the, the extra distance of the detour. Uh, but it really worked well uh, from a safety perspective in that, you know, not only, as we'll show, uh, there were reduced incidents during our construction period, uh, but the people got an extra year out of this, this interchange. So um, it really allowed us to get a lot of work done in a compressed time frame. So here's some uh, examples of some uh, innovative uh, pieces of, of, of work that were new to Saskatchewan. I know that Diverging Diamond uh, opened in Calgary uh, prior to the, uh, the one on the bypass here. Uh, but this involved a fair amount of, of work with uh, uh, SGI, which is uh, Saskatchewan Government Insurance, uh, ensuring that there was driver education um, as to, to what uh, these um, the new roundabouts and diverging diamond entail uh, in terms of uh, guide signing, wayfinding, uh, how to approach it, and some of the safety benefits uh, we would anticipate. 
So um, it took a little bit of time to uh, explain to folks that uh, um, you know that the traffic patterns really suited these configurations and uh, would really result in, in improved safety in the long term. Um, so those are new. Those have been operating for a while now, and, and uh, we've certainly seen a, a reduction in, in collisions uh, in the bypass area. The other aspect uh, related to safety, um, this bypass I included a fair amount of, of ITS scope. Um, so, you know, keeping with the safety theme, a lot of these items, including uh, enhanced, um, some weather monitoring uh, information, uh, cameras uh, throughout, um, as well as some way in motion infrastructure, um, really helped us to just have a better sense of, uh, of traffic uh, incident detection on the, on the corridor, um, and also reduce exposure uh, to things like, um, you know, truck inspections, uh, heavy vehicle inspections, uh, by using technology to do this. So, of course, none of this gets completed without um, having some boots on the ground and um, this project saw almost 8,900 distinct project orientations. So those would have been people being oriented, oriented to the safety rules of the project prior to accessing the project. Uh, that includes, um, of course, RVDB and, and all the subs and suppliers, inspectors, et cetera. Uh, and that's over a almost a four-year period uh, so so that's pretty incredible uh, there was over five million worker hours uh, that includes again um, all of rbdb and its contracted uh, subs and suppliers and the total injury rate um, so that includes your lost times um, your modified works and uh, actual um, first aids was 0.32 uh, which is remarkably, um, it's an it's an achievement that everybody's pretty proud of on this job. Uh, zero, of course, is the target, uh, but 0.32 uh, is all of the lost time times 200,000 to represent 100 workers at 40 hours a week for 50 weeks per year uh, divided by um, total hours. So it's an incredible accomplishment and um, definitely um, something that we're very proud of uh, on the safety side of this project. Um, what I didn't include in this slide, but I'll, I'll share, is uh, the number of design hours that were put into the project, uh, which would not have been counted in these worker hours. So Parsons um, logs just over 215,000 hours of effort. Our subs combined uh, another 100,000 hours. So looking at about a 315,000 our effort on the design side um, to produce just over 4,000 drawings um, that went out to the field to get uh, to assist the build. So uh, again, a remarkable um, achievement for such a scale and uh, and such a low injury um, rate with, of course, zero fatalities, which is which is what we're all aiming for. Another safety element. Um, that we incorporated into the project was to reduce contact hours. And so we, you know, we, of course, we want to keep these worker hours down when we can. Uh, I'd like to advance the slide. Um, we had a deliverable. The final deliverable of the project on the design side was a uh, updated topographical survey. So the ministry had provided um, airborne lidar, which was uh, varied between about a uh, let's say a half a meter to a, just over a meter in, in accuracy. Uh, that was our design base. We compared that, of course, to some ground truthing when we had survey crews on site and, and got everything matched up for execution. And then when it came time to update um, the topographical survey, we chose to go a, um, an innovative way and, and use a terrestrial mobile mapper uh, based on a truck unit. I don't know why I cannot advance this slide for you. There we go. Um, and our provider in that case was Global Raymac. Uh, 
Western Canadian based survey firm. Uh, they brought the latest technology. This thing was about uh, a month old when, maybe two months old when they used it uh, to collect our data. So all service roads and uh, any improvements that we had had to be collected and of course updated. So the method we chose on the left was the truck uh, for collection. So there was a, it's a one day collection. It was a long day but it, all the data we needed was collected in one day. There was a three-day um, uh, ground truthing exercise to get our targets and, and the rest laid out, uh, not, not dissimilar to what would have happened on the conventional side that was estimated it would have taken 54 days. So not only did we avoid um, traffic accommodation setups and workers adjacent to live traffic, um, we got it done in a day. Uh, the results of the survey came in at uh, well, sub 20, sub 30 millimeter accuracy, absolute, uh, with about a 10 millimeter relative accuracy. Um, so the surface is pretty amazing, and uh, we handed that back to the ministry again um, while keeping everyone safe and um, out uh, of the influence of live traffic. And so here's the, yeah. here's the meat. Yeah, so th this is um, you know one of the the slides as we were uh, in the lead up to this presentation. Um, this this is data supplied by uh, SGI Saskatchewan Government Insurance, um, and it's it's grouped into um, prior to construction, during construction, and post construction from left to right here. Um, so these are you know property damage, injury, and fatal collisions. Um, you know that we that we saw before uh, work started, and we started implementing temporary uh, speed zones and traffic control measures. Um, you know that that middle period is often a very challenging one. Um, often often crashes can go up in work zones just because of the the constant changing of conditions and people adjusting to uh, to lower speeds in the presence of workers. Uh, but we were we were very fortunate and uh, in working with our, our partners um, to really um, drill down that culture of safety and a big part of uh, you know installing these these temporary traffic signals was it was it was a win-win in many ways it it helped us to complete our work faster uh, but it also helped to address uh, some of these long-standing concerns. Uh, regarding access and I think you can see here that, that there was a, a significant drop in that three-year construction period um, obviously um, you know with 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 COVID uh, changing uh, traffic and commuting patterns um, uh, that certainly uh, gonna change uh, perhaps in, in years to come as well uh, but uh, but certainly a, a good example of how we can um, you know, use our opportunity as a design builder uh, to, to help address safety issues while we do our work. So that's the presentation. And um, the next slide just says, thank you for inviting us. Again, I'm gonna try to get that on the screen. There we go. And uh, of course, we have time for questions. Um, I guess back to the moderator. Awesome. Thank you, Jim and Jason, for your presentation. Uh, and had some technical issues, so I'll be moderating. Do we have any questions? Oh, and you're back. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how good it's going to be, so keep going, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any questions in the chat yet. Uh, might as well, if anyone has any questions, just unmute yourself and you can speak up. Oh, here's one from Jack. Uh, can you discuss how this south alignment was decided? Seems like it was bypassing traffic pretty far south. Okay. Yeah, I can I can take that one, Jim. I think it's yeah. a lot of it is um, you know when you look at um, the areas of Regina still to be developed. Um, you're right. It certainly when you're out there uh, today, it, it is quite a ways out but in many ways planning for the future growth of the city boundaries. Um, if you look towards the, uh, the southeast, 
um, that area of Highway 33, you can see uh, some of the new uh, residential subdivisions uh, going in there and it, it tucks in quite nicely on the inside of that uh, that ring road. So really more of an anticipation of, of future growth than anything. And on the west side of the south there too is the um, Global Transportation Hub. Uh, so that was the a land port initiative um, supported that's needed proximity or wanted proximity to the ring road. And so I think there was some of uh, some of those considerations in the alignment selection. I must I must say that it wasn't our uh, our purview to select the route anyway. That was uh, the ministry that did that. So. Uh, but some of the reasons that we've heard uh, as we we ask those similar questions. Thank you. Yeah. On the accident history question, um, and to your question about the accident history, um, it, it was fairly easy to to obtain um, just because it is a kind of a centralized uh, government insurance agency, and they do they do track these statistics. Um, you know, it, it was also something that at the onset of the project, um, you know, we had we had kind of worked to obtain this information just to understand a bit of background. And so they were extremely helpful um, and curious themselves as to as to what the what the patterns have been since uh, since construction started. Yeah, it was just interesting that they had it broken down by sections of roadways then as well in their database. Yeah, it uh, it synced up quite nicely because uh, that that section was, I mean, the one major component of the highway that we were rebuilding. Um, so they had some good uh, good geographic data on the limits of a before and after comparison. I have another question uh, from Tony. Is the diverging diamond working as expected? For example, similar to international in terms of collision and capacity. Any comments on the operations or feedback from public before and after? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, certainly, uh, I think every time one of the one of these DDIs goes in, you're going to get a different. Uh, uh, kind of group of people at its different perspectives on it. Um, I think uh, with with our DDI, we probably haven't had it fully in service uh, long enough to to compare it to other jurisdictions. But certainly, um, from the perspective of of eliminating um, you know those kind of high severity you know 90 degree angle collision, I think it's been a success. Um, in terms of the driver education. Um, you know, they, they all have a, a few quirks. Uh, you get questions. We even had questions after opening, you know, can I make a left-hand turn onto the left-hand roadway, uh, even if it's a, a signalized intersection, kind of treat it like a one-way street. So, you know, you kind of have to go through into the, um, you know, your, your, your local jurisdiction's Highway Traffic Act and, uh, and, and confirm some of these things. But I think one, once people get the hang of it, particularly since, um, you know, it's the same group of people traveling through this interchange each day. Um, they get the hang of it pretty quickly. Sure, Jason, I, I had a question. You mentioned that there was a driver education program partner with this Scott Farming. Uh, was there any inno innovative ways that you guys did the education program? Yeah, a big part of it was, um, you know, we had a we had a, a project uh, communications manager, and uh, you know he was kind of in constant contact with uh, each of the communities and the various uh, industries to keep them informed of upcoming changes. So uh, the local community was extremely well tied in and 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 involved. They'd come to all of our um, regular coordination meetings and ask questions. So in many sense, you know, we were responding to. Uh, really good questions that they had posed to us. Uh, we did a number of outreach sessions uh, in person um, as well as online and worked with SGI to update their driver's handbook uh, relating to the kind of signs and markings that you would see at these locations. So kind of a kind of a joint effort, um, really a, a lot of lot of interest uh, in the project and uh, that I think that uh, helped us 
uh, craft some good information for them. Thanks, Jason. Uh, we have another question. Was there any background work done on the origin destination of road road users? Uh, a lot of that would have been uh, during the planning phases uh, when they were de defining the corridor. So uh, we would have been less involved in that, but uh, you know that was certainly a key aspect. Uh, they did do, I believe it was an ME uh, regional travel model uh, to help uh, understand you know how many people would use the bypass um, and uh, how much traffic it could take off of, say, Victoria Avenue. So a lot of this was done in the, in the lead up to the project. Thanks for your answer. Um, just checking, do we have any more questions coming in? We'll give it another minute. Maybe not. Will this eventually be a ring road? So there is, uh, <laughs> There is some future compatibility uh, built in even to the new portion of the ring road here. So uh, there's there's an opportunity for uh, enhancement of our rotary interchange, uh, making it a, a full directional interchange. And then at Highway 11, which you see at the very top of the green line there, uh, we had to design for an ultimate systems interchange to essentially project out and around the northeast. Uh, so uh, we had to design to accommodate those future ramps and flyovers and so on um, with, with the plan in the longer term to connect all the way around and, and create a essentially an outer ring road. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any more questions coming in. So thank you again, Jim and Jason, for your presentation. Uh, we'll be making a donation to Engineers Without Borders on your behalf. Thanks again. And for everyone who's still on the chat, we, uh, we will be opening this webinar to everyone to network for half an hour. So unmute yourself and turn on your cameras. Let's chat.